Welcome, Peter. Thank you. Uh, we're going to play some sounds, right. okay? Fico e profissional de classe médica, esperando a sua ocorrência aos hospitais, a fim de prestar a sua eventual colaboração que seja, que seja sinceramente desnecessária. Porque a história se merece. So, do you recognize any of these sounds we are playing? No, I don't know where it's from. Um, tell me. Uh, they're sounds from the Portuguese Revolution, yes, so, uh, from the 25th uh, so, of April. Not the 25th of April, but yes, I recognize them, yes, obviously. Yes, exactly. Yeah, they're wonderful. Okay, we have the, the record there. So this, this is a record of the day, the actual oh, day. Right. So, so we played first just a little like, excerpt of, of what Joaquim Furtado read on the radio mm -hmm. from the armed forces, the, the movement. Right. And then there's some, some sound footage of uh, people uh, outside the PID um, right. headquarters yeah. asking them to come out. So. Fantastic. I haven't come across this. But obviously I know about it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so. That's why you're here. Of course. <laughs> yeah. um, so, Peter, we, we wanted to start by asking you um, just the background. Where are you from? Where did you grow up? But also your family background. Okay. Can you right. tell us a little bit okay. about that? Thank you. Uh, it's very important to me. It's part of my story. Um, I was born in South Africa and I went to a white school and uh, uh, racism was very strong there. And my parents were opposed to the political system in South Africa. They were against apartheid. And so they were imprisoned after the Sharpeville, which people may not remember, is, is when uh, a lot of blacks had a peaceful protest about passes, having to carry identity passes. When was that? The 60, 60 1960, April 1960. And so they arrested, uh, uh, they set up a status of emergency and they arrested 20,000 people who they were scared of. And they arrested my mother and my, my father and um, 20, as I said, 20,000, 19,000 blacks, 1,000 whites. And that was really uh, yet another episode in the step up of the resistance in South Africa and for many years afterwards, it was a very bad time. Since then, the Communist Party started talking about, uh, and Nelson Mandela started talking about uh, armed actions and stuff like that. And when my mother and father came out of prison, they made the decision to migrate to England. That happened when I was 13 years old. It was a very important formative experience for me uh, because of my parents were making a stand, which very few white people made. And... Uh, uh, and since then, I've, on and off, I've been involved in social movements and politics. But I came over to England and grew up in England at the age of, um, you know, a year later, 14. And how have you become politically aware of Portugal and the Portuguese Revolution? Um, I, in, the, in the late 60s, I joined, I was very interested in African socialism. Uh, then people said, you can't just have African socialism, you know, it's a, it's a utopian thing. So I became very interested in the notion of socialism and people from below. So um, many arguments about what happened in Russia. And I joined a political organization which said that Russia was a, a, was a for, form of state capitalism. That's called the International Socialists. They've always had a perspective of revolution, of people below, of oppression, uh, and Russia being as equally as bad as the United States, but in different ways, uh, you know, neither the East or the West. And when the Portuguese Revolution started, we, we started hearing about it. We started sending people over to uh, report, listen, learn, and so on. So we sent people over in 74. And I've got documents here of, of the people who went to, 
talking about the, the different groups and what was happening. We tried to report the stories. Um, I was at that time a political organiser in Manchester for the in, what was called the International Socialists. And in, different from the Socialist International, right? Yeah, very different. Very different. Very different. <laughs> uh, How so, many were in your group in, uh, uh, in England? In England, England? about 3,000. 3,000. It's, it's a big group. So, uh, it's the most important of the far left groups. Trotskyists? No, the breakaway from, it's more independent than Trotskyists, although we saw obviously Trotsky fought against Stalin and uh, that, that's, you know, and, uh, um, but the, the, the development of the theory was that uh, it, it wasn't a jet, this is getting very narrow in terms of jargon and stuff like that, but it wasn't a degenerated workers' state. It was actually became a new state, like a capitalist state, but just controlled centrally. So, uh, so the, we broke to some extent from the Trotskyist tradition, we're more independent, it's called state capitalist. But in a way, that's you. We can get locked into the language, and it's important. But uh, uh, to understand that Portugal was important, you didn't have to come from our background. To understand there are a lot of people from the left, but we particularly emphasised the, we, and we saw that Portugal was an opening for the rest of Europe. And uh, and and it certainly was in lots of ways. The establishments were very very worried about Portugal. I remember speaking to somebody from the Italian army, and he told me how Italian troops went on the streets and demonstrations in support of Portugal, wearing the uniforms and wearing red uh, scarves around their face so they wouldn't be identified. That level of insubordination in the Italian army was very, very scary. And you also had insubordination in the French army. So those are little indicators of how of the impact of Portugal was having upon the armed forces in Europe. I mean, it's, it's not a revolution, but it's, it's, it's insubordination, which is great. So, mm -hmm. and so, You're particularly passionate about this relationship between the people and the armed forces, isn't it? About this, this alliance... I, I'm very, very interested in it. Also, there are some uh, uh, downsides of that because there's a danger of romanticizing the armed forces and depending too much upon the armed forces. You, what you had is the most extraordinary breakthrough in Portugal of the arm, and a radicalization. And you've had it in one or two other countries at certain points. You've had it in Egypt for a bit, a sad story. You also had it in Ghana, Jerry Rawlings. You've had people radicalizing the armed forces. And in order to have a revolution, you've got to have that. You can't, you can't succeed without you, and that, that's happened in the Russian Revolution and also in Germany. Lots and lots of the army uh, went over to the side of the workers or to the Soviets, to the workers' councils, or, or, or what infrastructures they, they were. So that's absolutely elemental. Maybe the danger in Portugal is that people are too romantic about the army. They are too romantic. We're too think? romantic. Or they were. Okay. You know, so, I mean, it's such a wonderful thing to have uh, to be able to stand in a tank with somebody, mm -hmm. and to be able to put the carnation into the rifle, but that uh, that perhaps blurs the real problem about the army, and uh, 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 and the infrastructure. The you know, so uh, uh, so the, 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 that is just perhaps an aside, um, and what you needed is uh, organization which was independent of the army, which can still continue to win the army, sections of the army over. But I, I have, I mean, I had amazing experiences, even though I didn't speak much Portuguese, or very little Portuguese. Um, uh, I had amazing experiences, even with members of the armed forces, and I'm going to tell you about one of them now, if you don't mm -hmm. mind. Yes, please. So, um, and this is in the early 19, uh, early November, 75. I was in contact through my organization with an ex-CIA agent. His name is Philip Adji. And he wrote about Portugal when he, no, he, uh, when he left the CIA. He was, he was stationed in Portugal and he wrote about it. Mm -hmm. And he wanted to tell people what the CIA were doing. Okay. Uh, so uh, through my organization, we were arranging him to come and speak to people in Portugal about what the CIA were doing. And uh, I wanted, to, and I spoke to, I forgot him from people from political parties and I wanted him to talk to them, the army, to members, the soldiers, and what's happening. And I was able, able to walk into a barracks 
ask for somebody whose name I've forgotten, who was a very junior person, not, not a senior officer, and he promised me that if I get this man over, he'd get a meeting of soldiers from every barracks in Portugal. All he needed is three days' notice. And this is before he had mobile phones, mm -hmm. but they had the network the infrastructure that SUV was strong at the, the, this, this, this time. So here I was almost able to get a meeting together of all the army to hear about Philip Adji. Now, that never happened because of November the 21st. But for me, that is the most incredible recollection of the capacity to do things. You know, things when opening up and all the barriers falling down. Because you can't go to any country now and try and do anything like that. Mm -hmm. Now, it didn't happen, but nevertheless shows. For me, it's, uh, 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 it's one of the, uh, not a pinnacle, but one of the things, that's a marker for just, just how things were possible. Then, um, you know, the, somebody said that Portugal, that period was so much freedom because people had been so oppressed for such a long time, as you, as you all know, and then the things, people were smiling, people were able to do things, and I believe the number of babies that were born after April the 25th <laughs> were, were, went up enormously. So, uh, yes, you're uh, right. Uh, so, so we'll go back to this uh, 25th of, of November and Philip Beji, but maybe we go back a little bit. I, I really would like you, if you can remember, the day that you arrived in Portugal yes, for I, the first time I during can, the revolutionary period. Yes, I can w remember. What date was that, first uh, of all? It was the end of August 75. The hot summer the of hot 75. Summer. Okay. Okay. I can't remember the exact day, but I remember the demonstrations that happened on the Saturday. And uh, I remember, uh, there's a lot I can't remember, but we, uh, uh, I came over as a group of revolutionaries and we had special arrangements and we stayed at a hotel which was under workers' control. And the first thing the workers did is they welcomed us. They sat us down in the meeting. They explained how they organized. They gave us a discount. So, uh, and uh, so, so I, I stayed in that hotel for a week. But what does that mean? What does workers' control in the hotel actually mean? It means that the managers had run away or been kicked out. I don't know. But I think a, a, lot, a lot of times managers were so scared of what was happening that, that, that they left the country. And 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 uh, uh, and uh, or the owners, and so the workers had to run the place themselves, and also the tourist industry was chaotic, and so the but but um, and they they're very keen to have any tourists, revolutionaries especially. So <laughs> so, um, so. And what does that mean? What does revolutionary tourist actually mean? Well, the, we didn't go over for the sun, and uh, for the for the fado, <laughs> we we came over to see what people were doing. And to, to celebrate and listen and hear all the activities because what was happening in Portugal, although it comes through a, a, a filter, we know that was happening was absolutely incredible. Those of us who were listening uh, uh, and, you know, the, the, whether it's the subversion of the armed forces, the takeovers in the factories, the takeovers in the land, the takeover of the, 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 co the cooperatives at that time, the emergence of popular assemblies, that was absolutely incredible. I mean, it's, it's, it is unparalleled, although you could say May 68 had some of it, it was a much shorter period and much less actual takeover and change of the structures than what happened in Portugal. Because you, you know... Uh, so that, that was happening, and for months we've been hearing about it one way or another. And by the time the international socialists, they, they started organizing trips of comrades to come over to go and visit factories, to go and visit my wife. I uh, went over to a hospital where the nuns had been in charge, and the, and the workers said, no, we're sick of the tide. we don't need nuns to run us, we can run it. And they told the nuns to clear off. And they took over uh, uh, and uh, other people went and saw clinics. Um, I went to see, I went to places. I also went around some of the set, political sets. So I spent that two weeks. First week in the hotel ambassador. And then the second week I went and stayed in what was uh, part of the place I stayed in was a brothel. Um, and I'd never realized it was a brothel. But when I came back to Portugal, uh, I came back to Portugal uh, in early October, 
when I was an organiser and they asked me to work there. And then I found out it was a brothel that I was staying in. But um, Where was that? Was it in Lisbon? It was in Lisbon, off the Avenue de Libertad, a couple of streets behind. Yeah. So, um, so you want, if you want the phone number and address, I'll give it to you. But <laughs> <laughs> you still have it. <laughs> no, of course not. <laughs> uh, um, but, um, uh, but, and one of the stories that's been written about is how prostitutes gave a discount to, uh, to soldiers which I was, uh, uh, um, uh, but I found that actually very interesting because once I started recognizing some of the prostitutes and <laughs> getting to know them very, very slightly, I mm-hmm. just found that very interesting. But this is, I've got nothing to say about it, nothing <laughs> to expose or anything like that. But uh, it's and, one of the stories. And so that summer is known as the Vrankind or the hot summer. Mm-hmm. What does that mean to you? Like, uh, how do you understand the, the summer of the uh, 75 in Portugal? What did you see? Well, what was the, atmosphere? Our, our, the atmosphere was absolutely incredible. Uh, obviously, you had a backcloth as well, which we didn't see much of, which is the re- return orders. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, a, um, also, the, what's happening up in the north, the burning of, uh, of the headquarters and, the, and, and, and their reaction. So, but we, we didn't see that. What we saw is enormous, enormous demonstrations with the life and colour and youth and elderly, or such a cross-section of a population. I remember people coming in tractors and coming in uh, trucks on the backs of tractors, people with the farm implements, a lot of uh, agrarian people. The summer and also up to November, there was an enormous demonstration on November the 16th, which I'll never forget, mm-hmm. which uh, ended up at Palacio de Comercio, uh, and went down Avenida Libertad. And people just come in, you know, they must have left at three o'clock in the morning to get there, to go on it. So not only demonstrations, but going into workplaces and talking to people and whose eyes have been opened, if that's not, um, where they just felt that they could do anything, where before they couldn't, they were trapped. You mean about fascism uh, and the dictatorship and, you know, and the, the expectations. So all these people had doors opening to them, which is the most incredible thing. It happens in re- pre-revolutionary or revolutionary periods. Marx talked about the, the, the carnival after um, uh, 1848, uh, and there are uprisings and the most incredible communal spirits, which are very, very hard to imagine, but we know about it. And it's endemic in revolutionary processes where people get together and organize in ways that you've Never, which then don't believe that it's possible. Mm-hmm. And we saw some of that, and this is perhaps the most vivid experience from Western Europe, since, uh, of course, I think it's in many respects more vivid than, the, than May 68, so the, since the Second World War. Uh, certainly in Western Europe, you also have had some things like the Hungarian uprising of 56 and so on, but, but they are very marginal compared to what's happened in Portugal. So you stayed two weeks the first time. Then I went back. Then you went back. As a political organizer. Mm-hmm. One of the things I helped organize was we had a, a speaker from uh, Lijnav who came in. Uh, the company? S- yes. Yeah, so he, his name is um, Kolos Nunes, I think. I've got it here. Uh, and he was a young militant, a lovely, raw fellow who joined the PRP. And um, he was elected. He's one of the minority of the PRP on the Workers' Committee because I think the Workers' Committee was dominated by Maoists, UDP, and uh, uh, had some Communist Party people there. But, but anyway, he was a, a young fighter. And, uh, we, and he came, we'd, I helped organise meetings in my city, Manchester. And um, I organised meetings in 60, 70. I organised with comrades. Uh, he went and saw an engineering, small engineering factory in Manchester, and he spoke to all the workers there, there's 20 people there. They, they stopped there, you know, at their lunchtime. They stopped and they listened to him. They had a translator. Uh, I, I, organi- I tried to organise a meeting with uh, shipyard workers. Nobody turned up <laughs> so, uh, because we didn't have enough connections in the Manchester shipyards. Um, and we organised meetings in Stockport in Manchester, about 60, 70 people. I've still got the leaflets. Um, uh, and we had an organising committee in Manchester support to Portuguese workers' revolution in my, uh, uh, and we tried to get links between factories in, in, in our area and in, in, um, 
So, so I did that amongst as a general political organizer, but Portugal was obviously aflame. Um, and then after a, f a few weeks, my organization sent me back to Portugal to become a full-time organizer. They sent two of us across because we said, we've got to take it this really seriously. And uh, so I went back in... Um, when was that? Early October. Early October. Yeah, just, just after Carlos uh, Nunes uh, came over. And for how long were you here then? Until May 76. So you were here during the 25th of November? Yes. Um, and um, I'm a, uh, one of the things I remember very clearly is I had a friend who stayed in the, uh, the PRP set in Barreiro. And um, so, and he always picked up the gossip and the news and the information, whereas I was stuck in this brothel, I didn't pick much up. And, and uh, sorry, I exaggerate, I'm making a cheap joke about this place, <laughs> if I said. Um, but he, I met him in, in, the, um, uh, in a very large Portuguese cafe in Avenida Libertad, uh, uh, one of those wonderful old cafes. Um, and he said, things are about to happen today. This was a Tuesday morning, I think it was, and I met him about half past ten. He'd just come in there. For, we had a we had a meeting of our organisers, of the international socialist organisers plus Portuguese friends. How in, many in, were you here? About four or five, uh, uh, the, slightly more, but but four or five in the cafe. And he said to me, Peter, this is happening. It's good. and I, because I'd heard so many scare stories, I said, no, it's not happening. But and of course, I was wrong. What did he say? Actually, was he it said the right are on the move. He said, a coup is about to happen. From the right? From the right. Not from the left? Not from the left. No, of mm. course not. So, but, but, uh, and that's the way the, the story's been, been represented, that the left are trying to organize a coup. Yes. We can talk about that in a minute. But but my big mistake and was, I said, you're wrong. And uh, and uh, But I spent the rest of the day being driven around. I went to uh, Ralish. And there was no resistance there at all. Not hardly anybody standing outside the gates of Ralish. We went through Monsanto. Then we went to, by the night, we went to the military police, where um, it was very interesting. We saw people arguing with the bus driver. He said, we've got to turn the bus over to form a barricade. And the bus driver said, mm, you, you sure? Because he's a bit worried about his bus and getting home. And stuff. <laughs> And he said, no, I don't think so. <laughs> and then later on that night, um, a friend of mine who is a Portuguese person who went back from Portugal, from England, to Portugal to be active in the revolution. He was in the PRP and he was able to join the military police because I don't know how he managed to do that. But uh, he, he decided to take up his conscription and he was put in the military police, which was, at that time, was one of the most important units in the country, politically the most important unit. And so he, and I interviewed him afterwards, he was put in pr prison. His name is Alfonso de Souza. Mm -hmm. And he was put in prison uh, alongside Isabel de Karma and Carlos Chantunes. And uh, he was framed uh, 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 because his, his mate who was involved in some nonsense. But anyway, Carlos told me that the, he was looking through the, the, the hole with the guns, looking out for the commandos, prepared to shoot them. And what happened while he was doing this, somebody came in and said, Carlos, drop your gun now, otherwise I'll shoot you. And it was his cousin. And the, 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 the commandos had a secret entrance into the military police headquarters, which that's how, they, they, that's how his cousin got there. So you've got a member of his own family threatening to kill him. But I mean, for me, that's another incredible story. Um, um, anyway, the, the, so that's what we happened on. And then in the next few days, we organized a lot around that. We we're trying to understand the nature of November the 25th because it wasn't a repressive right-wing coup. It was a re-establishment re of the establishment consolidating and squeezing out people it didn't like. Mm -hmm. And we all... We, we printed this in Portuguese and in English simultaneously about a week afterwards. And I saw this at the Metro, uh, Vincent Stoins, um, and I <laughs> saw lots of them because it was one of the first, uh, one of the first uh, publications in Portugal about November the 25th. Mm -hmm. 
And uh, uh, so I haven't looked at it for a long time. I don't know whether it's any good or not. But, but at least, <laughs> at least we try. It's to quite analyze. hopeful. You, yeah. you, 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 you know, you finish on a note saying that uh, the there is a defeat. The defeat in the twenty fifth of November should be used to teach each uh, each worker in Portugal everywhere the key lessons necessary to achieve victory, proletarian victory in the okay. future. Isn't the language yeah? old so. fashioned? But uh, but. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, okay. We but were, you sold a lot, yeah? We sold a lot. Yeah. Sense, <laughs> yeah. And in fact, um, I wasn't paid much money, but they said keep the receipts of this. So, <laughs> <laughs> so who translated it? It was translated uh, in, in, in England, right? In England by a Brazilian speaker. You wrote it? I uh, know. A, a man called Tony Cliff. Oh, uh, Tony Chris Cliff. Harmon wrote okay. it. I was advised a little bit, and it, I never wrote it. Because the, uh, but I was too busy anyway. And they theorists... And so they tried to analyze it. I mean, I talked on the phone, but they, they, they wrote it and um, tr translated badly, I believe. But we had it in English and we had it in Portuguese and um, we moved very fast. We also came over, uh, uh, I've got the notes somewhere in there. I had an interview with the, with the PRP mm -hmm. on the 3rd of uh, um, December. And one of our leading comrades came across with a lot, a lot of money. I think it was ten thousand pounds in a suitcase, but that may be uh, in a pro profit call. I can't say a story. I'm not sure if it's that amount. Hmm. But what we wanted them to do is, we said, what you have to do is you have to organise your structures and you have to have a daily newspaper. And we said, here's the money for a daily newspaper, and we said we will to get you a printing press if we can. But the PRP were in too much disarray then. And also they didn't have the focus of an organization that our old our organization had more of a Bolshevik tradition of organizing and, uh, and doing things. And uh, the PRP are very loose in terms of notion of memberships, of structures. Some of it is due to clandestinity and some of it is due to fluidity, which is very important. So, but it meant that their infrastructure was much, much weaker and much more uh, liable to collapse. And what happened is after November the 25th, most of the people were just on the run. Mm -hmm. They had some secret meetings. I went to one or two up in this area on the 26th with the captain, but I didn't understand it, unfortunately, from, from the MFA. On you the, went to a meeting? Yes, up, up in this area. On, and on the 27th, I went to a meeting in Algiers of the PRP cell once again. Uh, I understood very little. I didn't have a translator. They so. didn't provide you with a translator? No, no, but this is just a small branch meeting. These are the comrades in Algiers meeting together, wondering what in the hell are they doing. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, so I, you know, I was in the edges just observing. So, and, mm. uh, um, well, but the official narrative is quite different from what you're describing, right? So Which that on the 25th of November... The moderate forces defeated a threat of a communist dictatorship. Why is that so different? Uh, when you say the official narrative, the, I don't know which official narrative. Yeah, this, you're you know, about. this, this, this sort of narratives okay. that say that there was a red threat in Portugal and things like that. Right, but know. but the, but the communists would say the threat was from the extreme left. And they would say that it's not the communists, it's the uncontrollables who are on the edge of the communist party who are very heavily, possibly heavily influenced by the extreme left. The, the, I think you would find that some narratives say that the communist party wanted to ex exclude that danger mm -hmm. and they made a deal with Costa Gomes and others about, uh, uh, about um, how to modernize Portugal. And um, so that narrative isn't the one that comes to mind um, immediately. But, but, but every narrative will always blame the extreme left, the terrorists. In any situation you'll find there's always people ready to blame those subversives who want to overthrow the order without really looking at the, the concrete situation. So. I suppose also what Ricardo is saying is that there is this idea that the 25th of November is like this, uh, this prime point for democratic normalization yes. after a period of upheaval and excess and whatever. And that it really, the foundation of Portuguese democracy that some people say 
uh, starts actually with the 25th of November rather than with the 25th of April, you know. So, and in that sense, there's uh, it is sustained by this idea that there was this uh, le leftist coup being prepared, which from which we were saved from this other coup from the moderates. Uh, so this is kind of uh, the official. I agree narrative. with and I agree with that narrative except for one s sentence. Okay. Um, uh, the foundation of democracy goes back to the people owning and doing things themselves. And the foundation of democracy started on April 21st when people took to the streets and they started making a noise and they started organizing themselves. And the 25th of November was a consolidation, getting rid of the extreme left, if you like, getting rid of the uncontrollables, or whether it's, uh, uh, you know, the, 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 the people in various, various regiments. Uh, and so the establishment had to control that. But what they did is they, Portuguese democracy was much stronger after November the 25th because of what happened before November the 25th. So, um, if you didn't, the, the November the 25th still made concessions to agrarian reform. Lots of, lots of uh, uh, workers' rights were given. Uh, the, some of the, the, uh, uh, the occupation of the flats and the houses were apartments. I don't know much, but it was consolidated because of the popular force movement, not because of the, 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 the Democrat, the so-called democratic regime. But what was very interesting is that social democracy decided not to stamp on the movement. Mm -hmm. The Chilean, the Chilean solution wasn't a solution um, uh, because of the strength of the movement. They were scared to take or take the movement on head on. But what they are able to do is to cut off some of the most extreme wings and, to some extent, normalize it. So Portugal moved from uh, fascist, if, if you want to call it that, to uh, a social democratic system. And that was part of that tradition. So what can, um, I, th I think one of the big mistakes of the Portuguese left was to exaggerate the danger of the return of fascism. And it, de and it uh, deflected us from seeing what social democracy was capable of doing and understanding that Kissinger and others don't always think about the Chile model. There were other social, social democracies like a beast which can move in different directions and we, we underestimated the, uh, the responsiveness and the ca capability of capitalism to adapt itself in different situations. Um, and so you lived here also after the 25th of November through to 76? It's what was all the Through the Gadoops. And uh, at, I think I left around about the time of Tello's, uh, uh, I might have left before, but the presidential elections. So, um, mm -hmm. Explain that. Explain what was that day and what happened during those well, during elections. The, well, and the Gadoops, you could, you could explain the Gadoops. Yeah. Not very well, because I haven't thought about it for a long time. But the Gadoops were an attempt to get the left together uh, in organizing committees trying to harness some of the energy of the left. There was still a lot of energy in some ways, especially in terms of uh, resistance to um, um, uh, uh, defending workers' rights. Mm -hmm. And there was still quite a lot of strikes, even though the, the number went down enormously. And so I went around and I visited people and I t talked to them. I also went and stayed in an uh, uh, agricultural cooperative, Soldada de Luige, which is south of uh, mm -hmm. Setubal. And I worked there for a few days and I just saw the way that the women were involved and how they transformed the land, how they started growing uh, uh, rice. The, the water there was for shooting ducks, for breeding ducks and shooting them. And, and they, they used that water once the owners had gone to, uh, to grow rice there. And people from uh, Setubo, uh, um, from Setnav, came down, brought tomatoes, I think the, I think I got the story right. Might have taken tomatoes away, well, and I think they brought fish and they made fish stew and um, we had a lovely time. But um, and they made uh, sheep's cheeses, which was an unusual product, uh, and, and and tried to create a market for that. So there were uh, so after November the twenty fifth, there was still consoli attempted consolidation of cooperatives, and still an attempt to pull the left together. But it was pretty uh, the the Gadoops, with hindsight, even though a lot of us followed it and had hope in it, they were not fantastically significant. Basically, the movement had been defeated 
not that many people were killed or uh, many people imprisoned, but they were defeated by November the 25th and the left didn't have the capacity to reorient itself and to understand what's happening. And I think that process of understanding is still happening. Um, what and, do you mean by that? Well, so, certainly when I came back to Portugal five years ago, there were very, very few books about the Portuguese revolution. And the, the, they were mainly uh, mem uh, memoirs of captains and officers and, yeah, and, uh, and stuff like that. And the story of the workers and what happened in Portugal was is hardly shown in Portuguese bookshops and also in, in, uh, in English bookshops. Very few books in England about the Portuguese. Obviously, there's one or two books that you've got here. But, uh, but, uh, and uh, what I'm finding is that people are trying to analyse more now than I've known before. Can you pass me Peter's book? Yes. Uh, you write something on the intro of this book. Um, on page four, it's something like, a visitor to Portugal now would see little evidence of those Alcyon and believable days. Some wall paintings may be visible, a slender tribute to the creativity of the painters, people with little artistic and political training who, within months, painted gigantic murals. Since then, the whole thing has been allowed to dissolve. Only a handful of books has appeared in English. It is almost as if nothing happened, as if we have nothing to learn. I think that, uh, I think that, I wrote that quite a few years ago, um, uh, maybe 20 odd years ago. 99. Right. Um, and that, that's true, there's very little evidence. Very few people able to talk about it. I think for some people it's been uh, like a, a dream of drugs and you can't explain that in uh, ordinary language easily. Uh, uh, or, and, but, but I know that when you've been talking to people that they start talking about it and they want to talk about it and it's perhaps the most important thing, the single set of events other than their marriage and deaths in the family, but external events that's happened in their lives. But the, 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 there's an enormous role to try to capture it, analyze it, and piece the story together. And I think that's, and that was true 20 years ago, and it's, it's, I think it's coming together now, but there's all sorts of dangers in piecing to, together the story now. Um, like, but, uh, can you expand on that? What um, dangers do you think there are? Romanticization, mm -hmm. a distortion of memories, uh, perhaps uh, the things need to be locked into context, you know, uh, um, uh, the, the reason that the birth rate went up after April the 25th was because of the overthrow of fascism. It's not, not just because suddenly people became happy and made love to each other. <laughs> so, uh, so it's trying to look at the historical context of the, the these these things, and you know, of, of, oh, and of you know, the mid twenty eighth, and or locking it into those events and tracing things. Mm. Um, uh, but it's it's hard not to to be emotional about such a memory. I've seen you uh, uh, being rather emotional. Also, I don't know if I can say this. No, no, no. When uh, talking, for example, about the MFA. People are packed, and you know how you uh, no, I want also to, of your uh, own experience. Isn't uh, it's absolutely important to show the emotion mm. and to tell people those experiences, but also the question of how do you locate it, mm -hmm. how do you consolidate it. I think it's very important to not just take it from the uh, from the voice. There's a danger of a, of a, let, let's say um, my grandfather. Well, this isn't true, but if he went to the war. He would come back or went to the colonies, come back and tell stories and they get out of context and they become very uh, uh, just, just icons. And the question of trying to locate those icons and testing them, not, not disputing them, but testing the credibility and seeing the context is very important. And that's a historian's job driven also by politics because it's, you need to have sympathetic, I think, sympathetic politics to be able to do that. But some of the work that Jonah is doing and other people are doing is just really, really, you know, finding the, the contradictory stories of people and seeing how they fit in. The story of the Rutinados or the story of what happened in the colonies 
this is uh, it needs to be told and uh, um, and Portugal's role in the colonization in the, it needs to be um, but why do you think it's not told well, what's think, the reason well f firstly is that the victors don't want to tell the stories of the people that they smashed uh, uh, so the establishment gathers forces it doesn't want to hear its enemies now uh, there will be obvious examples where the, in Hungary in 56 so the uh, the uprisings in the factories um, are untold story and uh, the Communist Party don't want anybody to know about it and so they would discredit all those stories of CI and stuff like that you also had this although it's a much more benign establishment they don't want and the money for the research institutions were this you know and also a lot of people were tired in uh, after November the 25th so they don't want to hear about and we've, you know, going on and on and on about the glorification about it. They just want to get on with their lives. Uh, um, so you, you've got the victors, oppression, uh, the, the, the conjunction of um, economics and research and stuff like that. Um, uh, you've got the exhaustion of people. You've got demoralization. But after every defeat, it's very difficult to pull out the stories again. Um, um, in Portugal, maybe lesser because people weren't physically executed or, or not. Uh, and there's a lot of people with lots of memories one way or another. So, Peter, can I ask you, when did the revolution end? I think November the 25th, 75. That's when, when, when you can say it was social democracy. So but that's, that's your perspective uh, as a, you know, a person who has studied and thought about. But you've been here, so you've seen how things were still going on. So from that perspective of a person who was here after November mm -hmm. the 25th, when, when do you think it really ended? I wrote home on the November the 25th, and I said this is the end of the revolution. It's now... But the, the, the problem in the revolution is that's a finite word because it's basically, a, I don't want to call it, I often call it, as you do, a revolutionary process. So it's the, 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 the process. But I think that really after November the 25th, it went down enormously. And uh, so although there was still a lot of resistance and hope and excitement, the fact is that the you could no longer count on the military. That, um, but basically, if I'm asked for a date, I would say that's that's mm -hmm. uh, that's that's when it's ended. So, you wrote home. You wrote to your wife, or? and to my mother. I've and, got those letters. Somewhere. And you told them the revolution. The words lie in that effect. Mm -hmm. Yes. So, uh, if I dig it, I've got a. I can't remember. I, I had a very uh, cliched phrase, but it's um, but, <laughs> but it's, it's, uh, wasn't a beautiful letter. But but. But basically, that's, and um, I was, I was still inspired and interested, and that's why I stayed there. And we had hope, as is expressed in the, um, mm -hmm. in that pamphlet. Yeah. We had hope. Us revolutionaries always have hope about the future. But the question is, you've got to know when it goes from Monday to Tuesday, and uh, oh, you know, and and um, well, now I'm clear. That November the twenty first was the end of that process. But what I did is also is I went away and I wanted to write about it. And I spent 10 years writing this thesis, but I was um, uh, at the same time trying to get a job as I became a parent. Uh, I had a job, but I was no longer a political organiser. And so it's, I didn't have the time and resources to do this. That's why it took me 10 years. So I'd stop and come back to it. But basically what I look at in this is one of the key points for revolutionaries from my tradition was how the working people organise themselves. Because what you need is, uh, in Russia it's called Soviets, but in every revolutionary situation you've had workers' councils, not necessarily just of workers, but workers' organisations coming together with other organisations. It could be residents and, uh, uh, and, and community organisations forming their own organizations. And that's, that becomes the, the, the base for dual power, an alternative power to the state, and it gives something that gives the confidence and perhaps gives the food, 
it, it's something which uh, um, uh, the military did in the, the first place. I've forgotten the name. Where did the what is the barracks that the mili- that uh, Otello uh, uh, organized the coup from? From that Pontinia. Pontinia yeah. in the, in that area. The, the military had a good uh, relationship with the, with the residents there and they used military machines to improve some of the roads and to, to help build their infrastructure. And so what happens in revolutionary situations or, or pre-revolutionary situations, the Black Panthers did it also a lot, is they started feeding people. And the reason they got through to the members of the population is because they started feeding or they helped organising educational programmes. When you get that self-organisation happening, that's that is that is the basis of a revolution. You need you need those. You can call them workers' council Soviets, but but they've always emerged in revolutionary situations. It's not just the party with the politics. It's the infrastructure on the ground where people get together. So my thesis looks at looks at embryonic workers' councils, where the first thing I look at is, is the the interimpresas, that's the factory committees across Lisbon, which had an amazing power and organized some really wonderful things in uh, uh, middle and late 74. Uh, then I looked at uh, something called the CRTSMs, which was an organization by the PRP mainly, but with, with members of the left army. And they co- commissions the rev- uh, uh, residents, soldiers and workers, I think it was, CRTSMs. Um, trying to get them together to try to set up a, a, a counter power. That, that was very formulaic and didn't have roots, but what I wrote, I wrote about, about the, the connections there. It was very, very connected with the, with the infighting inside the MFA uh, and the 5th Division and all those sorts of things. So it was, it was a project um, partly uh, created by Cop- uh, Otello uh, and out of Copcom. But, uh, so I looked at that, I looked at the popular assemblies and uh, there were, uh, uh, I tried to count the popular assemblies. I think there's about 30 or 40 in the documents that emerged and some of the things that they did and some of the, many of the things they didn't do. And the last thing I looked at is a, a Sutuhu Committee de Luta, which I think was the most amazing uh, 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 organization, not so much the committee as the infrastructure that happened there and the connections they had with the building workers, the connections they had with the barracks, the connections they had with Setnav. And if we had a lot more places like that, then we might have been able to resist November the 25th much, much more. And can you explain what that is? Um, explain what? The, These committees? Yeah. Is the Tubal Committee do a little? For um, example, yes, but I, I, I'm doing it off memory now. So I've got I've got it written up in, in, in detail. It was a meeting of the residents plus people from factories, including Setnav, pl- and including members of the um, the military, and they met every week. And all, also, what's a very important thing that happened was the takeover of the newspaper Setubulans in uh, in uh, early October of seventy five. And there was a very big march, maybe 30,000, 20,000 people. It was where they supported the workers and wanted to run them. And what the newspapers did, like Republica, was they published all the stories of the local people. Uh, 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 very often the stories weren't edited and they're written by local people and they were just communiques from the factories and very, very boring. But, <laughs> uh, but, but nevertheless, what the, so you had this, you had this, you had the workers' newspaper, you had the barracks who were prepared to defend the workers, you had the, uh, uh, they, they had a, some talk with the uh, um, with the construction workers, the building workers. But the, one of the criticisms of my times, I remember the building workers coming in to hear talk about their struggles, and the people weren't really interested. And the building workers struggle, as my friend George is sitting over there. Well, we've talked about it earlier today. Was fantastically important because that was. The real threatening is when the building workers forced the uh, um, they surrounded the parliament and the and, and the government said we can't govern it. So you had, but also you had elements of the building workers struggle there, uh, and you had Sitnav, which is just, uh, and you had uh, so so they organised through a, a if you want to call it a Soviet, it's if uh, um, I know that's a Russian word, but 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 it's that it's that tradition. They organised. And they had subcommittees, 
They talked about land. They talked about rents. Uh, the, this book talks about that. A lot of that is a lot of that in that book. So it talks about the control of the rents by the people in the area. It wasn't by a government officials. It's by the people in the area demanding and saying this is what's there. So when you get to that level of uh, of control, that's very very exciting. You're talking about people running something and owning it and and being inspired by it. And um, and there were a number of meetings of the of the committee itself, which sometimes seventy or sometimes one hundred and fifty people went along to, and it was seen as the alternative power. Now that's happened in a lot of places, but nowhere as strong as Setubal, uh, um, and that is one of the inspirations that that, that that I want people to remember because because these organisations happen always when people come together. They start fighting. They start building their own power structures. Now, um, they might be flabby. They might be weak. They might be dominated by intellectuals. Uh, in the Supersubal Committee, de Luton, the, the Marxists, and I mean, usually the, when Marxists talk about the Marxist, Leninist, Maoists, not the Trotskyists, they come along and they speak a very particular language and they don't relate to people there. And, the, uh, and, and if you look at some of the... Uh, some of the uh, the stuff written from that time, from the interim presses, the language they're talking is just absolutely crazy. And how can you start talking about Albania being the socialist future and stuff like You know, absolutely, I can't believe that anybody could ever relate. But there's a, there's a woman in Setubo Committee de Lutu, she said that the people would teach those people to learn how to speak normally. And she said we would find ways of overcoming the sectarianism and the dead ideology of the, the ref, some sections of the far left, and we'd start finding a way of working together. And that's absolutely wonderful. It's where, where people learn to become people, if you like. Uh, I, I, may, I may sound condescending, but I'm sure um, many of you, well, I'm not sure if many of you have seen the old left at work and how, and how out of touch they can be and how locked into their ideology I've read the pamphlets. So, so, yeah, it yeah. is very, very sad. Yeah, so, so, but 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 uh, you saw this revolutionary process happening in, in Setubal, and I, I know it happened in lots of places, but Setubal, I think, is the most. And I, I would argue, that, and I do in my thesis, and or maybe in that little booklet, that um, if the other areas had been like Setubal, but you still needed a national coordinated response. Um, to November the 25th. So you needed the barracks in the various areas to say, don't give in to the commandos, we're on your side. You need a, a, a national infrastructure. And how that infrastructure is built is another matter, but that is still, uh, you, can't have, uh, you can't have local insurrections like you did in 1932 in Marina Grand uh, without it being, it has to be connected Otherwise, it's going to be smashed like it was in Marina Grand. So, um, um, I think it was 32. So. But, uh, can, I, can I ask you something about, in this thesis, you interview uh, former revolutionaries or still present revolutionaries. Mm. Um, you, you conduct quite a lot of interviews, as you've shown me the list. And, and they're conducted after, or rather after the revolution, so 82, 1980. So how did you find these people? Well, I, st you, I still had some connections with some people. No, no, not, not in that sense. So how, how, how were they? How were, you know, okay. in terms of, uh, of their relationship to the revolution or to the 25th of November, how, how did you find them um, in that sense? I don't know if I can generalise, but they were obviously, uh, it's not a revolutionary period, but, but they wanted to talk, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes it's very hard to get hold of them. I find it very hard to get hold of TAP was some of the stories of TAP in uh, 74 and got absolutely incredible how they occupied a plane, if I remember correctly, and, uh, and the militancy. So sometimes it's very hard to find these people. And for the TAP, it's a uh, mm -hmm. Portuguese speaking, and I had to have an interpreter. But, um, but yes, then. But were they discouraged? Were they, were they emotional? How, how, how was their relationship I think to the I suspect defense? everybody was emotional. Um, I don't want to create generalizations, but 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 everybody is very moved by it. And once they were there, they wanted to talk. Um, 
perhaps sometimes my questions are very narrow because I'm asking about specific forms of organisation which they couldn't remember. Or, or, um, so, but, but they were there. Your party was not an armed party, was it? Certainly not. Uh, <laughs> uh, and uh, that was our biggest disagreement with the PRP. Yes, I would like you to talk a little okay. bit about that. So, well, I remember when I... Uh, first visited the set in Barrero and there were maybe 20 of us from England and the PRP militants are so proud and there was a soldier there or, or I think it was a soldier and they wanted to show us this weapon a semi-automatic I can't remember whether it was called a G3 or AK3 but but, um, um, but he wanted to teach people how to dismantle it and put it together again and the focus, and, uh, and some of the comrades, so oh, this is you know, absolutely fantastic. It's, it's like they've got a, uh, a Che Guevara attitude or a Robin Hood attitude. You know, we can lead the revolution by, with the bloody arms. Uh, uh, and uh, so the, the PRP was very caught in this tradition of, of arms and military. And they're very proud of the fact is that they're able to free some uh, arms Actually, with the help of an MRPP militant, there was a truckload of um, uh, of arms that were stolen and redistributed to what they, what they call good hands. And they asked they asked a comrade of ours, to, it was an English speaking comrade, to drive that truck, but he refused to do that. This is MRPP uh, through the PRP looking for a driver, absolutely ridiculous. So, but anyway, uh, they they got that arms, and these arms were, and maybe many other arms were stolen or requisitioned from various barracks. To the PRP and or they, they they went to Lijnav. They gave some to Lijnav by what, by by all accounts. And, and, but that focus upon the arms, I think, diverted the the, the, st the story because the the story of Portugal is no longer, although the army is important, no longer about armed things. It's it's very very uh, sectarian. It cuts you off from people. The important thing is to organise with people on the ground. Yes, if need be, you need military support to certain situations. The army's friendly and they can come and support you. But to put the whole story around that, uh, uh, the PRP had a poster at the time um, uh, called Unite, Organize and Arm. Uh, and, and I was thinking of Lenin. He said, land, peace and bread. One is entirely internal process and operational. The other one is about reaching out to people. And that was the core of my and our arguments. Don't emphasize the arms in the way that, that you've done. Don't, the whole story isn't about arms. Arms are, are a tool. There's a place for them. But, but to write the story around that narrative is, it was wrong. And so that was, that was a major ideological um, 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 disagreement with them. And also, to some extent, within our own organisation, because our, our own organisation, there are young revolutionaries coming over there. They see, they see these sorts of things. They get excited by it. But at that time, we had um, um, we had internal arguments about that sort of thing. So, 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 so I don't know if that answers yeah, your no, point. Yeah, no, that's it's very, a, very you know useful for us to understand the difference. And, mm -hmm. and, you know, on, on this subject of, of uh, the PRP and their relationship to them, you say in your book, um, there's this, this, this note where you say that um, you, were, you were accused of being a CIA agent and not a common allegation. And si subsequently, you found a letter dated 1977 addressed from the PRP to all other political groups on the left, specifically warning them about your CIA involvement. Mm -hmm. So can you <laughs> tell us a little bit about this episode? Well, uh, I wish the CIA paid me, <laughs> but uh, I don't think they ever knew about me. So, <laughs> so um it was, um, we talked about it today, and we talked about it with George. It's the, it was just a crazy paranoia, but the PRP also had a very, uh, 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 the, these are friends, the PRP. Yes, I know. But within there, they had a very, very paranoid, militaristic, conspiratorial view, and so somebody being a member of the CIA fits in that. I fell out badly with the PRP. Uh, uh, um, they refused to talk to me. 
And, and what happens when you have a period of political bankruptcy and despair, you start inventing and creating enemies which aren't there. Mm-hmm. Um, but I must also say uh, I helped form a committee in England for in support of the Portuguese p- uh, political prisoners, which included Isabel de Karma and Carlos Chantunes. I went and saw them in prison afterwards. We had a small committee. In the 1980s? In the 1980s, um, early 1980s. We had a small... uh, uh, I saw them in prison twice. Mm -hmm. Um, We raised money. I got members of parliament, including somebody who's dead now called Tony Ben, to sign a letter. And I did things in support of them. Um, Now... And Amnesty International also became involved in it. Uh, they became involved in it before me, in fact. So, so, but I was picked up for some of the work they were doing there. So I did a lot of work for them. And Isabel de Karma knows me. And um, uh, she likes me. You know, she's, she's, <laughs> a, she's, a, she's a, I wouldn't say she's a good friend, but she, she knows me. And we're fond of one another. So, But this is just one of those also... Uh, like funny episodes of, of the, the revolution and post-revolutionary period where you find a letter accusing you of being a CIA yes, agent. Yes, my, my great mistake was not to take that letter. It was in the old major headquarters. I'm trying to find that letter, see what it is now, <laughs> because I'm very proud of it. <laughs> I want to have it framed. I was also accused of being a Cuban uh, when I was at the factory in um, in '76. And the whole, I was visiting somebody, uh, she'd written to socialist workers, so I thought I'd go up and see her. So I, f- I flew to Porter and then went to see her. And when I got there, the factory committee, uh, I don't know if the factory committee was in control of the factory, but they said they wouldn't let any Cubans onto the premises. And so they insisted on interviewing me, and I can't speak Spanish, I can barely speak Portuguese. And then they realized I wasn't Spanish speaking and Portuguese, and they said, no, well, maybe, maybe. And so then I saw this woman afterwards. But so, so there was a, another proud moment. So, <laughs> so. Would you read an excerpt of your book before we go? Okay. Which one? This, this. Well, I'll read the, the, the last phrase, I think. I'll see if I'm mistaken it. The fact remains that during those 18 months, it's 19, isn't it? Hundreds of thousands of workers took over their workplaces, the land and houses. Tens of thousands of soldiers rebelled. Nobody predicted that from a tiny political cadre, so many would try quickly to learn and to put into practice the ideas that explode from those who are exploited when they try to take control of their own destiny. Portugal 1974-75 was not an illusion. It was an extraordinary period, one that still needs to be studied and celebrated. So, thank you. So, thank you, Peter. Okay, lovely. Thank lovely. You. Uh, Maybe we can end with how how we started. So I'm gonna play some sound. Okay. Yes? <laughs> okay. This is from the beginning of the record. Okay, I'm gonna. Put Há uma palavra clandestina em Portugal que se escreve com todas as arpas do vento. Mas quando nos julgarem bem seguros, cercados de bastões e fortalezas, hão de ruir em estrondo os altos muros e chegará o dia das surpresas. Dia 25 de Abril de 1974. Portugal descobre-se livre de um pesadelo de miséria, injustiça e luto. O povo começa a sabê-lo às 4h30, da manhã mais clara dos últimos 48 anos. Aqui, posto de comando do Movimento das Forças Armadas. Ok. Thank you so much. Thank well, that's you. wonderful. Uh, if you can use it. Are we done? I think we're done. <laughs> Thank you so much. Pleasure. Pleasure. Thank you, Peter. Okay.